Hello, everybody. Welcome to the North American Research Interest Group. I'm happy to see you all here today. Um, this month's topic is Open Hardware Initiative. Um, I'm happy to introduce Ahmed Sanala, who has been working with several students. We have four different students today um, presenting their work. Uh, students from Boston University and UMass Lowell. Um, if you went to DevConf, you may have seen these students uh, before, um, and you get a chance to interact and ask more questions now. Um, and uh, since we have so much happening this, this time, I'm going to make my comments extremely brief. And uh, Ahmed, do you want to go ahead and introduce folks? Thank you, Heidi. So we've got four amazing talks today. The first one is going to be about high-level synthesis. How do we take you know C code and create hardware from that? Uh, this talk's going to be given by Hafsa Shazad. Um, our second talk is going to be about hardware operating systems. You know stuff you've been seeing in a CPU for decades. Now we're bringing it to uh, FPGAs, and so that talk's going to be given by Sahan Banara and Zaid Tahir. Our talk after that is going to be about place and route. This is sort of the really low level um, hardware uh, you know, generation. Uh, and this talk is going to be given by Shaji, who is from UMass Lowell. And then finally, our last talk is going to be about relational memory, where we're going to look at a use case for having FPGAs and you know configurable hardware. And this particular application is going to be about accelerating memory and storage. And that's going to be given by Tushar, also from uh, Boston University. So Hafsa, if you want to take it away. Hi, everyone. Good good afternoon. I am Hafsa Shahzad, and um, I'm working on compiler tuning um, high-level synthesis, um, uh, which is a project that Boston University uh, is doing in collaboration with Red Hat. I'll uh, quickly share my slides, and we can get started. Um, I'm sorry about that. It uh, says screen recording permissions on your computer, so I'm trying to um, fix that. I'm sorry about that. It will take a minute. Um, I'm sorry about that, everyone. Uh, I'm actually having such a screen recording um, on my MacBook. Um. Hafsa, uh, Hafsa, if you could uh, send me the slides, I'll, I'll share it for mine, and you can just tell me next. Go to the next one. Sure.
Okay. Okay, so I'm terribly sorry about that. Anyways, let's get started. Um, so our topic is reinforcement learning based compiler tuning for custom hardware generation. I'm Hafsa Shehzad, and um, let's get started. In my next slide, please. Thank you. Now, FPGAs are everywhere. Now, initially, FPGAs a couple of years ago were seen as niche components um, in the data center, in very small places like routers or data acquisition tools. Now, they are growing and they are becoming widespread. And we can see them at different places on the edge, in the data center, in the IOTs, et cetera. If we move on to the next slide, please. Now, one of the challenges um, why the potential for the FPGAs is still largely untapped is because programming FPGAs is really hard. And uh, a typical development time can take on the order of weeks to months. Uh, this is because we have seen that coding for CPUs is uh, sequential in nature. So what happens is that we write codes and each of those instructions are executed one after the other. But programming hardware is entirely different from, from programming uh, software. And uh, typically for FPGAs, we have these hardware description languages, and which are spatial in nature. So this means that literally hundreds and thousands of lines of code um, will be executed simultaneously in an, on an FPGA. And in addition to that, um, there's a hierarchical replication of, um, of um, uh, functions, so thousands, literally hundreds of thousands of functions can be replicated in order to express parallelism on FPGAs. And all these actually make the coding of FPGAs pretty hard. Um, moving on to the next slide, please. Now, our goal is to simplify that, and um, we want to actually be able to write a code um, using simple languages like C or C++ and be able to run it on an FPGA. And um, while this looks pretty simple, it is actually a very challenging uh, problem because uh, the this paradigm shift from going from sequential to a spatial programming model actually uh, leads to the introduction of a lot of dependencies and um, which are very hard to resolve, which are not very simple. Um, and this is where the challenge lies. If you move on to the next slide, please. Now, high level synthesis is actually this shift from sequential to the spatial, whereby we take a simple C code and we try to convert it into an HDL. And um, here's a simple tool flow that I've tried to summarize. So initially, we have a native compiler which checks, which checks for the functional correctness um, of the um, of the code and then we have an hls compiler which initially we can see that it converts our c code into its intermediate representation which is actually making it language independent whether it be c or c plus plus or OpenCL or whichever high level language we have used and then on top of it we are using the compiler middle end to optimize our code and the optimization typically for a compiler is done using these optimization passes or flags we'll discuss about it later as well and then at the back end um, hdl uh, generator from that compiler converts it into the specific hardware specific back end specific language moving on to the next now, uh, while people have been looking at HLS for generations now, uh, this challenge still exists. And one of the reasons is that HLS gives very poor performance. So a, a code which has been written in a hardware description language has um, orders of magnitude better performance than a code which is written in a C, C++, and then translated onto a specialized backend. And um, this is where our problem lies, and this is the performance gap that we are trying to bridge um, through this research work. Next slide, please. Okay. Now the motivation and goal. Now uh, the thing is that the problem space for compiler optimization, if we try to address this problem, there are just so many things that we can actually worry about it. And um, uh, if we move to the next slide, please. 
the the reason is that like i told that on the middle end we have a couple of optimizations that we apply on top of our intermediate representation of the code and there are so many ways in which those passes can be applied to a simple code we can change the pass ordering we can change the frequency of passes we can change the number of passes which are applied so there are so many ways in which passes can be applied and they can be varied in order to enhance the performance so actually a strategy is needed in order to come up with a plan of how we can do it and um, if we move to the next slide please machine learning is one way in which people have been addressing the compiler optimization space and uh, we have seen a lot of work of it um, in literature however little work has been done for high level synthesis in particular and um, um, among machine learning there are different strategies that can be used so there can be supervised unsupervised or reinforcement learning we have started looking at at reinforcement learning um, as our first plausible approach and um, what is reinforcement learning it is actually this interplay between the agent and the environment so in this case the hls tool or the hls compiler is the environment our agent is actually the brain of the system which are, which suggests what action should be performed in order to achieve the maximum performance and the overall goal is uh, to maximize the reward that uh, we can get from our compiler so that's basically whichever application or whichever code we are feeding we should be able to achieve the optimum performance out of that code and that is how we quantify or evaluate that performance by means of the reward metric if you move ahead please so our technical approach okay now uh, the state of art the, the way people have done that in literature and the absolute state of art in this field is that we apply passes one by one onto the intermediate representation of the C code and we evaluate the impact of applying those passes onto our system. And um, through this whole process, our reinforcement learning agent is actually learning what should be the best criteria. If it sees certain hardware design patterns, if it sees certain um, uh, frequency of reward, certain action spaces, what type of passes should be applied, at what interval, in what order, how many of them should be applied. So it's developing its learning strategy on the go. And this is where our research actually comes in. If we move to the next slide, please. Okay, so we have looked at um, different learning strategies, essentially looking at what how we can actually impact the learning of the agent so what it is learning how it is learning in order to achieve the maximum potential out of the system and um, we looked at a lot of strategies and tried to come up with um, different ways in which we can do that if we go to the next slide please here is um the different learning metrics that we have uh, we have so essentially what is done so far is that generally people look at the speed up over O3. Now O3 is considered as the standard for the compiler optimization and then how much we have achieved on top of that. So um, here a typical graph like the green graph that we see is actually how the agent is learning over time. And uh, we looked at different metrics. So we looked at not only how fast it is learning, once it has learned how much is the fluctuation band, how much the performance potential it has achieved within certain time frame. If we go next slide, please. Okay, so we did exhaustive testing, a lot of testing on all the state of art uh, benchmarks that that were there, and uh, uh, basically on all these learning metrics, and. Um, um, we were able to achieve results which give it give us better performance then um, uh, in each of those metrics in each of our benchmarks which give it a better performance over the base where base is the state of art and we have been able to see that we can achieve up to 23 times better performance learning speed wise um, with this, by varying the different strategies um, of the agent and the overall model then uh, four times better performance potential absolutely we can we are able to eliminate the fluctuation band so we get a very steady state um, result and we are able to achieve three times better performance than the base 
when we are comparing the speed up over O3. Now, um, one thing that I want to mention is that these um, uh, these metrics and these um, strategies are important for specific developer goals. So while learning speed might be important for one developer and for a certain application, it might be important for another developer to completely eliminate the fluctuation band or achieve speed up over O3. And um, this has been the um, basic um, um, uh, crux to our work that developers can choose whichever metric is important to them, whichever criteria is important to them, and then uh, choose the strategy that will give them the optimum result. Next slide, please. Okay. Now I'll discuss what we are doing as a next step. Um, so we can we are thinking of developing a rec recommender system that can on the go suggest what could be the optimum strategy. So the developer decides which. Uh, you know which goals are important to um, them, and then they can. The system can actually devise the optimum strategy for them. We can come up. We are coming up with better state representations of the code. So code to where can basically representing your code in the most optimal manner. Then learning the code annotations. So basically, it's inserting those compiler hints at the pre-processing stage. So before the code is actually fed into the system. Um, how uh, we can add these to the compiler on the go is able to extract parallelism and to further enhance the performance uh, potential that can be achieved from the code. Um, next slide, please. So in parallel, this work has been done on LLVM. We are in parallel looking at GCC, and my colleague Robert has um, extensively worked at GCC, and he has been able to um, 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 to compile a pass orderings at GCC, which is very challenging and um, um, very little of this work has been done in literature so far. And um, at present, he is working on integrating the compiler middle end and the front end to a compiler back end, which will be able to, which we can then close the loop and be able to um, get HDL from, uh, um, from a simple C program. Next slide, please. Here is another slide from Robert and um, um, showing what work has been done on GCC and how we are uh, moving forward, basically at the GCC backend stage. Thank you so much. Okay. I'm open to questions, please. Hi, I had a question. But yeah, two questions. One was the reinforcement learning. Does it require like a different policy for each type of hardware, or like how is it being set up in general? Okay, so there are many different policies that can be. If you're talking about PPU or A3C or policies like that, or um, if you are like on that note, there are different policies, and exactly this is. This has been the crux of our work that what type of policy or what type of strategy, like if we consider the whole system, uh, you know, uh, for a reinforcement learning, considering the action space, the reward frequency, you know, how we can um, change um, our agent for that case or the agent's internal policy like A3Cs, A2Cs, PPOs, etc. So, yes, looking at all of those because all of those are impacted by the hardware design patterns within our initial code and they will actually result in different performances so we cannot use the same you know we cannot apply the best same size fit all strategy for mm -hmm. each application so it needs to be tailored okay and the other thing i was wondering is what are the benchmarks you're running are they different programs or different hardware like I, I don't know this field super well so just wondering Okay, so we chose a large variety of different applications that cover the different scope of it. So, for example, um, um, in C, C++, there is CH Stone benchmarks. There are uh, some benchmarks by Lega Group that they have developed. So, basically, they have different hardware design patterns. For example, they cover matrix multipliers, you know, ADPCMs. They cover modulations. They co cover those, uh, you know, um, codes for uh, safety, etc. So, a vast variety of different different fields or different workloads that we use to test our um, system. Thank you.
Awesome. So um, if there are no more questions, and then we can then uh, pass it over to Sahan and Zed for uh, the TISL talk. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Sahan Bandar. I'm a PhD student at Boston University. Um, let me share my screen. It's time. Um, yeah, so today I'll be talking about uh, dynamic infrastructure services layer for reconfigurable hardware or DISL. Um, I will probably skip this slide, I think, because I've sarcastic most of it. But the basic idea is um, that FPGs are being used more and more in data centers as switches, NICs processors in storage and as disaggregated compute components. And it, it's not just the data center that FPGAs are being widely used. So it's actually only a small step from these remote FPGAs to the uh, FPGAs on the edge and IoT. Um, however, FPGAs are more challenging and needs a high level of expertise to program and extract full performance out of compared to CPUs or GPUs. We propose CPU-like operating system abstractions to overcome these difficulties and to get faster turnaround times, enable more focused innovation, um, improve application portability, and lower the uh, expertise requirements. Um, so the current state of hardware operating systems for FPGA development is that there's a lot of proprietary systems with varying capabilities. There's limited open source options um, and none are portable due to not having clear separation between code specific and generic code so the fpga vendors distribute their own systems large end users develop their own but for everyone else fpga configuration is inaccessible or very device specific so our solution is dissolved which is an automatic and scalable hardware operating system and BIOS generation framework. It will take a library of components and user requirements to generate the hardware operating system and BIOS components. The OS and BIOS components are separated so that the operating system can be fully device or chip independent, while the BIOS has all the files and device specific um, components so that it's easier to identify and modify these components when porting the operating system to another, um, and the applications can be ported from one device to another um, without mo any modifications. So this opens up a number of different research areas. So first we have you know, research enabled by this um, these are not necessarily new areas of research, but this is allows one to focus on the actual research rather than building the whole hardware stack just to get started. So some examples are smart NICs and offloading communication functions such as NPI collectives um, to FPGAs, and the network security, software defined networks, in-network compute, trusted execution environments, uh, HPC applications, and IoT applications. Then there's also research questions related to hardware operating systems themselves. Um, what is the architecture of a hardware operating system? How do we support multi-tenancy on FPGAs and what security primitives are necessary for a hardware operating system? And then uh, how can we leverage partial reconfiguration um, for application scheduling, and um, also, how do we overcome some of the limitations of the current use model um, for partial reconfiguration? Um, and also, what are the trust models we can um, implement? So, for example, can the FPGA have a zero trust model regarding the host operating system? 
let's give that a couple of examples. Um, so this shows a network isolation scenario where the FPJ sits between the non-secure and the secure domains um, and provides different accelerators such as firewalls, custom encryption engines, uh, etc., to enable increased protection for communication. Um, another example would be trusted execution environments. Um, a, a very straightforward application is secure enclaves. The FPG can provide processing elements and memory physically separate from the host system. And with a hardware operating system in place, unlike a simple accelerator use case, the FPG can dictate the terms of interactions with the host OS or any other process running on the host. Uh, a more complex example is overfloating parts of, uh, of the hypervised functionality in order to ensure that guest memory is protected from a compromised hypervisor. Um, so for, for instance, the FPGA can perform tasks such as setting up page tables and other data structures to manage memory, while the host is only responsible for performing computation and is not allowed to manage guest memory. So in, in this sort of a deployment, um, the, the FPG could be controlled over the network and not by the host so that um, the host has no um, control over the FPG. Um, so moving on to researching hardware operating systems themselves. So the first the first question that arises is, what does one look like? Um, so this, this figure shows um, you know, one configuration we have envisioned. Here, the BIOS component handles um, all the device-specific details like uh, peripheral memory controllers, PCI controllers, network, et cetera. And it provides a set of standard interfaces to the operating system component. Because of that, then now the operating system can be fully agnostic of the actual device. Um, and the OS then will provide services such as memory and communication to user applications, which are instantiated in uh, different regions of the FPGA. Um, and we would you know, leverage partial reconfiguration to place different applications and schedule them. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll have that capability with partial reconfiguration. If you are targeting, say, an edge FPGA with less resources to spare, um, an IoT optimized minimal hardware operating system can be used. Um, however, the application still should be portable between the different platforms as long as the two platforms have uh, sufficient, like you know, necessary resources and the peripherals necessary for that given application. Um, so currently, our focus is on building the component libraries. When building these components, our goal is to make them as flexible and as generic as possible uh, to improve portability and also use standard APIs and drivers. So we have identified five components that are applicable for to most use cases and standard implementations. We have the PCI subsystem for host device communication. Our implementation allows um, using standard in-kernel drivers for the host uh, device communication instead of using um, device-specific drivers. Um, then we have the network subsystem enable configurations such as smart NICs, bump in the wire FPGAs, and any other configuration which needs communication support. The soft core subsystem, which is particularly useful in devices with resource constraints. Um, and then the memory subsystem to handle external memory and on chip caching. Finally, the smart switch subsystem, which is automatically generated based on the user requirements uh, to connect all these other components together. Um, also, note that a subsystem is not just a controller, rather, a controller is just is a customizable component in a subsystem. Um, for example, a memory subsystem um, could typically have a DRAM controller and a last level cache. 
It could also include an HPM controller or a flash, flash controller, um, depending on the, the given platform. And each of these controllers will be customizable to fit um, a specific use case. Similarly, here's a detailed look at uh, the network subsystem. So it has so many different blocks which can be optimized individually. Rather than using a vendor provided uh, IP core as a black box, we like to unpack those and look at the individual components. So in order to make our implementations more generic, um, some of these blocks will be replaced by open source components. And there's also a lot of potential to optimize each of these um, components by adding more features and flexibility. Um, as for future work, um, we'll be adding more capabilities to these subsystems to make them portable across different um, devices from different vendors and make them scalable so that they can be adopted um, to different resource availability and performance requirements. We use our Vertio drivers for uh, host and FPGA communication. Currently, we only have uh, we only support Vertio console devices. We would like to add support for other device types as well, such as Vertio network devices and so on. Um, and we'll also be exploring partial ring configuration for both uh, the booting the hardware operating system as well as you know, schedule the, the user applications. Um, and, yeah, thank you. And uh, we'll be happy to answer any questions you have. I was uh, curious. You talked about the smart switch in mm -hmm. your diagram. Yeah. Um, is that just doing switching uh, inside one CPU, or is that doing other kinds of switches? That's, oh, it's it's inside the FPGA, and so we have these different components, and the comp the the components used in different configurations may differ. So we don't have a fixed interconnect to connect these things but it's dynamically generated. So it's actually an HTML script, uh, or like rather a text file, which basically describes the connectivity required and the hardware is automatically generated from that. So for ah, instance, okay. I see. for instance, let's say um, an H device, which does not need PCIe connectivity. I mean, it doesn't even have a PCIe controller. Right, right. So we don't have that, but we, it has a DRAM controller and maybe GPIO, like general IO. Um, so those will be connected to, say, a processor or something. But in a different so configuration, yeah. When you talk about the future work for having things work on different kinds of hardware, that's the, a lot of it would be in that piece. Yeah, and, and uh, that piece and uh, um, you know, adding more capabilities of making the, those subsystems more generic. Um, so the thing with this, these subsystems is, um, we we have to use certain components from the vendors, so things which are absolutely hardware specific. So what we are trying to do is we, we start off with the IPs provided by the vendors, and then we replace them parts of them slowly by step by step, which are not really hardware specific. Mm. And we'll end up with something minimal and generic that it could be ported simply by replacing that one component, which is specific to that given hardware. I see. And is that intention with the goals from uh, the first speaker for uh, optimizing the performance, like making it generalizable versus optimal? Um, um, so this is more towards make it the, the open, the make hardware open idea. So okay. it's not just the tools, but the actual hardware itself could be open source, but we have to have the vendor specific components to we had to reduce it to a minimum to make it actually open source. Got it. Got it. Very interesting. Thank you. 
And, um, you know, just to, just to add to that, and a wonderful question, Heidi. That's actually a very perfect question. Um, so what we want to be able to do, because we have configurable hardware, is we want to have only the pieces that are needed to do the specific set of tasks that we need out of that FPGA. And so it's a natural link between the high-level synthesis part where we have defined here is our application. And so from that, we can discover, or we're aiming to discover, what are the pieces I would need? Is this a memory-intensive application? Do we need lots of memory? Let me give, give me a DRAM. If I have small memory and I'm looking at streaming data, give me a network connection. So it's basically discovering automatically from the application what it needs to execute. And then from this library that we're building as part of this, we're saying, well, I want this piece, but I only want these subset of pieces from that. Let me just configure this out. And then here is the type of switching or connectivity that I want to expect. So let me then generate a script, a JSON file, uh, which the smart switch will take in and spit out the hardware where everything's connected out. And then we can deploy that. Got it. Uh, continuing that question conversation, I was wondering, is it similar to like what Yocto is to embedded, where it's like you're taking the pieces you need and keeping it and then making it small so that it's it's generalizable, but also you can make it optimizable, if that makes sense? Is it like that, or am I completely off base? I'm not quite familiar with what your two is, but I think you are right. It, okay. it, it is, right. yeah, I think you are on the correct track because we, we don't want things to be, so so, uh, so the FPGA vendors, they do provide things similar to this, but those are fixed. Those are called shells. Um, so those are fixed. So you use a fixed amount of hardware resources for that shell, and it'll have all these capabilities regardless whether you want it or not. We want it to be more flexible. We just we can pick and choose um, exactly what we need um, for a given application. Okay, thank you. So um, let's switch over to our next talk. Uh, this is by Shachi from EMS Law. She's going to talk about hardware configuration generation. Uh, this is really low-level hardware stuff, but it's important because you know up to this point with high-level synthesis, we generate a very high-quality uh, code for application, and with this, we tie in all the different hardware blocks needed to get that to work. But till we can represent that, you know, text, uh, textual, uh, functional equivalent circuit into actual wires and logic gates that are connected out or lookup tables that are connected out and, and they have a valid hardware configuration, we're not going to get that end hardware quality that we are working towards. So Sachi is going to talk to us uh, about that, how we're we working on getting to that step. Shachi, are you there? Her connection is still here. <laughs> so what I can do is then I can just uh, play the video. I think it must be getting dropped. Oh. So do you, do you want to present or should I play, play the video? While we're waiting for her, um, I'll just point out that we do have meeting notes and people should attach their slides to the meeting notes, a link to their slides, so that um, people who want to check these afterwards or look at the slides, um, especially if you have graphs, it's a lot easier to look at them in the meeting notes than trying to watch the video. So please add those in after you give your talk.
maybe we should go to the last talk since Shachi is having to rejoin. Oh, here she is. Hi, uh, can you hear me now? Yes. Awesome. Uh, I'm so sorry about that. Um, so if I'm traveling and that's why my talk is recorded. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Um, so please let me know if the audio is OK and I'll be here to answer questions. So I'll go ahead and share. Is the audio uh, OK? Yes, the audio is good, and we can see your first slide. OK, awesome. Thank you for. I says, yeah, I, if you're playing the video, we can't hear anything. OK, one second. Uh, but but actually, uh, why don't we do this? So um, I'll share the video. I, I think it's something to do with the browsers. Um, so okay. I tested it out. It should work. All so right. let me okay. play that. I'm sorry. No worries. Thank no worries. You. I'm Shachi Hadilkar, a PhD student at UMass Lowell. I'm talking about my project Open Source Toolchain Optimization for FPGA CAD tools. For this project, I'm advised by Ahmad Sanaula and Martin Margala. Let's take a look at the background. While FPGAs are ubiquitous due to their flexibility, power efficiency, and programmability, a complex CAD tool flow is needed to map FPGA code to the hardware. The first step is synthesis, which converts code in a hardware description language to a netlist, which shows the different resources on the target FPGA and the connections between them. The next step is implementation, which maps the synthesized design to the actual FPGA hardware. Bitstream generation is a one-to-one -one mapping to generate the bit file required to program the FPGA. The example on the slide is for an adder circuit from Verilog to Bitstream. Verilog code for the adder is synthesized to look up tables for computation and flip-flops for storage available on the target FPGA. These elements are packed into clusters by the packing algorithm. The placement tool finds locations for the clusters in the packed netlist on the FPGA hardware. Routing finds the best path to connect the placed clusters. The implementation stage is highly dependent on low-level device details. The synthesized netlist is in the logical space, whereas the physical netlist represents the actual FPGA hardware. So even if the prior stages are optimized, the quality of implementation can greatly influence area, resource utilization, circuit frequency, and power. So this stage is critical. Of course, major FPGA vendors like Intel and Xilinx build their own CAD tool flows. These tools are easy to use, state of the art, and produce good quality hardware but they have their share of problems. Vendor tools provide generic optimizations for a large number of input circuits. They also have expensive licensing. And as these tools are closed source, they cannot be customized. Vendor CAD tools also often have long turnaround times. In recent years, several efforts to build open source FPGA CAD tools have been made. This is good because these tools are highly customizable and don't restrict the developer. Open source tools can also be improved by leveraging community support. 
but open source tools are not without limitations firstly not a lot of commercial fpgas can be targeted by open source tools mainly due to a lack of knowledge of the underlying device architectures these tools also aren't always practical for real workloads and the hardware quality is still somewhat lacking compared to vendor tools this brings us closer to our research Several open source tools targeting vendor and theoretical FPGAs exist. There are some interfaces to vendor tools as well. Efforts have been made to make open source tooling more generic, which can produce good results. But we think that hardware quality of open source CAD can be further improved by learning how critical algorithm decisions should adapt to input hardware patterns for this we also want to build our own heuristics in a scalable way this brings us to our objective our goal is to improve the quality of implemented netlist by automatically tuning hardware generation policies Eventually, we want to help bridge the gap between open source and vendor tools. This is the framework we have built for tuning critical decisions in CAD algorithms. We focus on the packing stage of the tool flow. We aren't looking to reinvent the wheel, but we look for suboptimal policies in existing algorithms. We identify a set of policies to target, then we build synthetic benchmarks to give maximum information for a specific decision that the tool makes. We use a set of post packing and post routing metrics for determining hardware quality of the implemented netlist. The policy tuner is run once for a given device architecture in CAD tool. For us, Xilinx CD7, FPGA and the VPR tool. This gives us the policy map, which is the mapping between the input hardware pattern and the target algorithm policy. The policy map is then used to determine the best packing algorithm techniques for a given input logical netlist. Currently, we are doing this in a semi-manual way. Let's look at the details of our framework. For the packing policies and metrics, a lot of published work on VPR exists. We use it to determine target policies and hardware metrics. We measure resource usage, fan out information after packing and also typical post route metrics like critical path delay and routed wiring. The second part is the synthetic benchmarking. Several CAD evaluation benchmarks like Titan, VTR7, MCNC exist, but they do not have the isolated hardware patterns we are looking for. The synthetic benchmarks give information on the target policy. We use open source tools for synthesis and place and route, so we have control over optimizations and our hardware patterns are not just removed by the tools. For our initial experiments, we use Yosis for synthesis, VPR for place and route, and the Xilinx RTX 7 FPGA as our target. The policy we are looking at is cluster input pin utilization. This is one of the tunable parameters in VPR. It is a measure of how dense the packing is. To measure hardware quality, we observe soft logic block utilization after packing. We observe the total wiring and maximum circuit speed after routing. VPR's default for input cluster pin utilization for logic blocks is 80% of the total availability. We tune this parameter according to the inputs and present a comparison of VPR's defaults and our tuning. We have tuned the parameter for tighter packing. 
So the inputs in these experiments are the synthetic benchmarks and the number associated with each circuit is the number of lookup tables and flip-flops. Um, this graph shows logic block utilization. Uh, we do expect to see a reduction in logic block count because of the denser packing. After tuning, we observed approximately a 50% reduction in logic block usage. We also observe um, wire length post routing um, and we observe a reduction in wire length after tuning the cluster pin target. We observed a maximum of 23% reduction in total wire length. Finally, we look at the maximum circuit speed and we see an improvement in all cases. We observe a maximum improvement of 13.57%. There are cases for which VPR's default performs better than our tuned version. And this just goes to show that the algorithm policy needs to adapt with the input benchmark. So we want to learn the mapping and improve the outputs, which we can eventually automate. Currently, we are working on isolating the impact of each policy for VPR's packing algorithm. And we are also expanding our metrics and adding more policies. We have shown the effectiveness of our framework with our initial proof of concept. We are extending our policy set and tuning them. Also, our next step remains um, using machine learning with our framework to truly automate it. Here is a list of references for the talk. Thank you so much for your attention. Um, are there questions? I think we'll have to uh, skip questions, even though there's a lot in that, <laughs> just for the reasons of time, Sashi. Thank you. OK, thank you. So our, our log, last talk today uh, is by Zhu Xiong who is going to talk about relational memory, which is basically how do we use FPGA to improve database performance. Uh, you're, you're muted. muted so. uh, sorry about that. I forgot to unmute myself. I'm going to reshare my screen. So you can, you guys can see my screen, right? <laughs> okay, yes, you. that was fine. Yeah. So I'm new to this Google share, Google meetings. I'm a little uh, confused what to do. Anyways, uh, hello everyone. Welcome uh, to my talk about relational memory. Uh, this work is a collaboration with Shaheen uh, Papon uh, from Boston University, Dennis uh, from Technical University of Munich, Ahmed and Uli from uh, Red Hat, and advised uh, by Natu and Manos. Uh, relational databases are widely adopted in many uh, applications like business systems, uh, online shopping, banking information, and even the phone has their own relational database these days. Um, the data in relational databases is organized in, into tables, and table, each table contains the data in relation. Uh, this example shows the healthcare information that stores a person's uh, age, height, and weight. 
And if you want to answer this example query, uh, we need to access high field and find the name and ID where the condition is qualified. Uh, in order to answer various adverb queries like uh, our previous example, there are two representative data layouts, row stores and column stores. Uh, row stores organize uh, relational database uh, row by row fashion in memory, while the column store keeps the table column by column. Thus, the same data da uh, database is stored differently depending on the data layouts and performance of these data data layouts varies depending on the queries. Uh, so row stores are more suitable for queries that access uh, the entire row, while the column store shows the better performance for queries accessing some part of the columns. Uh, in, pro in order to provide efficient query processing, there are adaptive layouts that uh, initially build the row stores for queries assessing the entire rows and then convert the row stores into column store for answering queries assessing only few columns. Uh, these, day, these layouts can support efficient performance for any types of query. However, they need to keep multiple uh, copies of data with different layouts. This requires heavy bookkeeping, higher complexity, which makes the code less scalable and harder to maintain. So what if we could access only the desired columns without storing or maintaining multiple copies of data? In other words, what if the optimal layout is always available? The thing is the optimal layout changes for each query. So in order to generate the optimal layout for each um, so if we have query something like this, an optimal layout would be uh, uh, have columns uh, of uh, like name, ID, and height. And if our query changes something like this, uh, calculating the average height uh, from the table, then the optimal layout would be the table only contains the height field. And if you're uh, query changes to something like this and uh, your optimal layout is changing. So in order to generate the optimal layout for each query with no extra memory footprint, we introduce the fml variable. Uh, the fml variable is a special type of variable that is never instantiated in memory. Instead, upon assessing such variable, the underlying machinery is set in motion, and generate uh, an on-the-fly projection of the requested columns according to the format that maximizes the raw data raw quality. So when the new query comes, uh, the ephemeral variable is newly created on the fly. Uh, the on-the-fly data reorganization is possible using the technique called program of logic in the middle. Uh, this shows the traditional processing system with CPU and memory. And there are platforms uh, that consist of both processing system and programmable logic, such as uh, Xilinx or JustK or Engine. And uh, the Plim technique uses uh, these um, PSPL platforms and Plim technique captures the transactions from the CPU and processes it as needed and returns the process data. Uh, the, thus, the Plim has a great advantage that it does not require any software modification in uh, to uh, do the uh, data reorganization. So we have built relational memory engine in the FPGA uh, for the uh, on-the-fly data reorganization. So our relational memory engine consists of four major components uh, that sits in the programmable logic. And uh, the trapper captures the uh, the read transactions from the CPU and uh, let the 
the, our IME engine knows that the transaction is in, initiated and monitor bypass uh, monitors the completion of the data availability status of each reorganized data lines. And loop cluster is the uh, brain of this machinery. So you're orchestrating the access to main memory. And that unit is the um, is responsible of receiving the chunk of data from the main memory and extracts the only final boarding call. Robert saying, Robert saying, you must immediately board at gate 37. The doors are closing. So, the, where am I? Yeah, so the, the fetch unit uh, extracts the valuable parts of the data that it receives from the memory. And this is our, how our, uh, memory relational memory engine is so i have because of the time limits i have removed uh the many details of our uh, relational memory engine and how it works so if you are more interested into uh, our memory uh, relational memory engine please refer our paper or also there is a poster available and let's move on to the evaluation so we have uh, implemented our relational memory engine into the Ultra Agilex Ultra Scale Plus platform, and the PS part is working on 1.5 gigahertz, while our uh, relational memory engine works at 100 megahertz uh, frequency. And as you can see, the utilization of uh, resource utilization of our relational memory is pretty low except the deep VRAM, uh, since our uh, relational memory engines uh, stores the reorganized data into the data SPM. So um, that requires lots of memory consumption, but this can be uh, reduced if we reduce the, the size of the relational memory engine, uh, the data SPM of the re uh, relational data memory engine. And so, um, I'm going to show you the, uh, the benchmarks of the relational data uh, memory. And so first, uh, one is to evaluate the projection, performance of the projection, and second one is for the selection. And third one is uh, when the projection and selection is happening, and fourth and fifth uh, benchmark is uh, for more complex queries like uh, group by or join. And we have uh, compared our perform uh, our relational memory engine to uh, row stores and column stores. First one is when we uh, vary the projectivity. Projectivity is the how much portion of the, the columns are accessed for that specific query. So here we increase the number of columns that we access and we normalize the execution time by raw store. So raw store is always one. I, uh, as we increase the number of columns that we access, the performance of column store decreases. However, the, our uh, RME shows the uh, constant performance improvement regardless of the productivity. The second one uh, is when we um, introduce the selection to qu uh, the query. Here, the selectivity means uh, the, the 90 percent of the condition is uh, qualified. So uh, as you can see, the, uh, the RME's latency is, uh, is stable uh, regardless of the row size. And this is the, uh, when we vary the number of uh, columns in the selection and the, and the number of columns for the conditions as well. And 
as you can see, this is the comparison between our RME and column store. Uh, if you think about our first uh, experiment that varies the productivity, uh, in that case, the RME shows the worse performance than the column store when the productivity is uh, very low. So we, um, similarly to that, so when the number of columns used in this uh, query is very limited, so the, the red corner here, uh, the performance of RME is worse than the column store, but um, in most cases, RME shows the uh, way better performance than the co traditional column store up to 2.2 uh, two times faster. And this is the comparison with the uh, RME versus uh, raw store. Uh, the darker the color is the performance, a uh, higher performance gain. And as you can see, the RME never uh, shows the worst performance than the raw store and it can speed up the raw store uh, the data access by 1.5 times faster than the traditional uh, raw stores and this one shows the, the performance of the group by here the selectivity is 10 percent so So oh, as you can see, for the some for the complex queries, the RME shows the better uh, performance than the raw stores or column stores, and this one is the performance of uh, joint queries. So here we used a traditional uh, hash join algorithm since uh, the the hashing cost dominates the the execution time of the queries. So the, um, we differentiate the CPU cost and the data uh, retrieval time. So uh, for the CPU cost there, the RME cannot do anything to improve the CPU cost for hashing. However, our RME can uh, reduce the data retrieval time uh, regardless of the raw size, as you can see. So uh, when we think about, only think about the data movement, then we can uh, save the data movement uh, by uh, 41%. So uh, the last experiment, uh, we are using the TPCH benchmark, and we are using uh, Q1 and Q6 uh, since uh, they are uh, using only one table in uh, the, uh, the Q1 uh, uses lots of, there are lots of uh, group by or order by, there are lots of uh, complex uh, CPU operations. So here we can expect uh, the, the performance improvement by using RME uh, would not be uh, very effective for Q1, while Q6 is a uh, simple selection, so we can expect higher performance improvement uh, for Q6. So as you can see, uh, there, uh, so as we expected uh, the, for the Q1, so there, uh, the performance gain is uh, not great because uh, the Q1 is uh, CPU dominated queries, while Q6, uh, regardless of the data size, we can, uh, the RME can improve uh, the execution time. Um, as a summary, we have uh, proposed a relational memory on novel software hardware core design paradigm in here uh, we provide the optimal layout for every query by using the um, ephemeral variable. Ephemeral variable is a simple lightweight abstraction to use the relational memory. As a result, uh, we can show the table get better performance than the column store or raw stores. So as extensions, we 
uh, planning to implement our relational memory engine into the memory controller so that uh, uh, the the data so we can further uh, enhance the data movement from DRAM to uh, CPU and uh, we are also trying to expand the application so we believe that the data reorganization can be also beneficial in uh, other data intensive uh, applications such as tensor slicing and so we are working on that too as well um, thank you very much for your attention and so our uh, relational memory work is accepted and going to be presented in EDBT next year so the if you scan the QR code on the left side you can uh, have the access to our paper which has more research and detailed explanations and uh, if you don't have enough time to go through our paper uh, there is a poster uh, at the research uh, there the research page of our project so please refer to our poster thank you thank you very much Xu. um and i apologize that we don't have time left for questions um the links to the poster that you mentioned are in the chat on the side um, or you can find it on the red hat research website yourself um, please do take a look uh, and follow up directly um, after this if you're interested um, and you please do add a link to your talk uh, afterwards sure thank you very much i appreciate all of you speaking and um, uh, thanks to the folks who came and uh, thank you for staying with us a little bit longer appreciate your attention see you next month for uh, another research interest group meeting and uh, possibly sooner than that, if you're interested in this memory topic, there'll be a research days talk by Renato Mancuso. Link for that is in the chat as well and on the research site. So thank you all. Have a good month. Bye. Bye. Thank you.